The following program contains images of nudity. Hello and welcome to Four Corners. For our last program of the year, we're bringing you a very special film. It's hard to describe the feeling of watching someone you admire and love as a colleague come to grips with an illness that is taking away the qualities that make her who she is. Liz Jackson was a giant of this program and one of the best journalists of her generation. In tonight's program, she does what few television reporters ever do, which is to turn the camera on herself, not in strength, but in frailty, in order to tell the story of her illness, Parkinson's disease. Liz made this film with her partner, documentary maker Martin Butler, in part because Parkinson's, the second most common neurological disorder in Australia, is so little understood. But she also made it to show the effects of pain and fear on herself and her family in a way that is both unflinchingly honest and inspiring. I wept when I watched this film, not out of sentimentality, Liz would not tolerate that, but because she shows us the deeper reaches of what it means to be human. For over 30 years, I reported from the front lines of war and politics. the chaos, the looting, and any possible revenge killing. I get a little nervous when we get in these big crowds because, like I said, it only takes one of them with a stick of dynamite to throw it in one of these vehicles and... You told Australians that you knew that Iraq had chemical and biological mm. weapons. Do you think it's time now to tell Australians you were wrong? Well, the intelligence assessments haven't been vindicated, but I made my statement based on the intelligence assessments. Not disputing that, I'm just mm. asking if it's time now to say to Australians, look, looks like I was wrong. Can well, you say that the intelligence assessments have turned out to be inaccurate, and I've said that. Can't say I was wrong on that. The winner of the Gold Walkley, Lynn Buckfield, Peter Cronauer, Liz Jackson, for their Four Corners program, Stoking the Fires. Thank you very much indeed. I have to say that um, I'm absolutely delighted and privileged and a little overwhelmed. In 2014, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. It's a disaster, she's not good. No, you don't look good. In front of two falls in the day. Yep. Yep. That's about five days ago. Well, come and sit down. Are you okay to sit down? Yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah. about to... I'm due a Matapan. I'm wondering if I should take it now. If that's yeah, right. Take it straight to cycle. You go ahead and have those. Have there been other falls? Um, yes. Yeah. This is a very hard story for me to tell because it involves exposing my current condition to a public audience. How, you know, not a spin I feel that for such a common disease and such an ill-understood disease, there's a desire to, in some senses, keep these things private because, in a way, you're not the person that you were before and you feel more vulnerable and more open to people's judgment and pity. And I don't want pity and I don't want judgment. Do you want to lie down there? I don't know. Try, try, try and get down. Hang on the breathing. See, this is like when I saw you in hospital, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. 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 This is just as bad as it gets, isn't it? This is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go to the breathing. Just try and try it. Try coming in through the nose. I can't. I can't do this. You've got to. Why? I can't lie down. Okay. Of course you can lie down. I can't get up. Yes, yes, I step. We'll just slip off. No, you won't. You won't slip off. You won't slip off. You won't slip off. Do you want a blanket? Don't it's feel like you do. have to take part in it at the moment, Liz. It might be best if you just take it really easy there, OK? And we'll kind of talk through what, what we can do next. 
what we are trying to do at the moment is kind of stabilise the dopamine levels. Yes. Yeah. Where is it? I've developed, apart from Parkinson's, a propensity to have panic attacks and I can have them several times in a day. Yeah, because it's not really... The medication's not really kind of kicking in. You are going through a truly hellish experience, Liz. The things that worries me most is, is what it might do to my brain. I mean, there's... No doubt that people in my position are much more vulnerable to, to dementia. Just want to see what your blood pressure's and that's what I've relied on throughout my career and throughout my life, is my capacity to, to think straight. And it's the fear of losing my, 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 my sense of intelligence and responsiveness and losing the sense of who you are. That's my mother and father walking down Burke Street in Melbourne. My two older sisters, we had matching dresses. This is the first time I went to England on my own. Like the classic bedsit. This is where Martin comes in. Good. It's basically that's in Agnes Place. Don't mind that pose, isn't it? That's a good one. The first time I met Martin, as I remember, is when I went out to his place and um, I don't know quite how to put this. He he and um, a friend of his were completely off their faces and now my memories are obviously a little clouded given the uh, psychological state that I was in or the pharmacological state that I was in. But my abiding memories are of extreme health. You know, Liz looked fantastically healthy, sort of tremendously bright white teeth, and obviously this sort of uh, fantastic body. I remember doing a backbend to impress them. It seemed to make some kind of impression. <laughs> I thought that Martin was pretty cool and pretty wasted in a sort of Keith Richards kind of a way. But I was actually on with somebody else in his house at the time, so it was limited to finding him an interesting person. Uh, I think the truth is that you're on with three other people, two other people at the time, three at the same time. Well, Didn't have room for a fourth. Well, if we're going to be particular about it, <laughs> there was a girl-boy ratio in Oxford that was very advantageous to women, and uh, I didn't have any formal commitments, so I was open to offers. <laughs> When I first met your mother I was playing in a bar She walked in with my girlfriend My foolish girlfriend brought her there She looked so pretty and dangerous as she brushed back her head And I was I hoped to fit my whole life in this photo and then I ran out of room. Taking notice in that bar When I first met your mom Love like a bird flies away You find out Love like a bird flies away. Have you had Parkinson's long? Five years. Not here. Were you sure when they first told you? What did you think? I thought, shit. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> what were you saying? Most people get better over time or get used to it? Or... Get used to it. 
I still don't feel great. Well, when you've been highly motivated and then you get hit with bugs, it just slows you down and then yeah. presses you. However, what sort of work were you doing before? Cancer. I'm a lawyer. You're a lawyer. I thought you might be. <laughs> Did you still work? Seven years old. Yeah. You could be doing an interview like you're doing on Four Corners. Slightly different sort of take from this one. <laughs> we all seem to have different set of symptoms. Some people are more tired than others, some people have pain, some people are like depressed, some are not. Well, how long have you had it? Uh, about six years. Six years? Yes, but um, I, I believe that you usually have it three or four years beforehand, before you get diagnosed. Lifelong punch. Okay. What did you think when they said you've got Parkinson's? Well, I'd been shaking for quite some time with just this hand uh, and arm until all of a sudden one day I noticed my fine motor skills doing buttons up and my gross motor skills and I realised that there was more than that. What does the doctor say about what's coming down the road for us? What does he say? I don't ask. <laughs> you don't ask? I don't want to know. <laughs> I feel a bit like that, actually. It does pull you up with a bit of a jolt when you see somebody suddenly deteriorates. You think, gosh, is that what's in store for me? Suddenly you can't walk properly, you've got a walker or end up in a wheelchair. There's nothing that you can do to put that off if it's going to happen to you. It's just, you just have to carry on day by day and be thankful that today's a reasonable day. Good morning, sir. <laughs> Good morning, madam. Good morning. I am very good. My name is Liz Jackson from ABC TV. Oh, ABC TV, yes. Yes. Yeah, cool. He's the uh, national commander of the border patrol unit. Good to speak with you, sir. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. One of the horrible things about Parkinson's is that you get what they call a mask face. You sort of start losing your facial expressions and you just have this mask. And I notice it when I look at the brushes of the film. I, I think, oh, my God, you know, what's happened to my face? And like, oh. anyway, I hate it. Just one of those things. It's the pain that, that accompanies it. That's what I find. Yeah. Difficult. Well, pain is actually pretty common in Parkinson's. The extent to which you have experienced these waves of pain that are inseparable from what we call panic attacks is unusual. You know, it's not, it's not kind of common garden Parkinson's disease. And plummeting levels of dopamine can be associated with all sorts of weird and very unpleasant symptoms. I'm wondering what got me the diagnosis of, yeah. of um, Parkinson's because I've never said to have tremor. I've I just don't feel I have the symptoms. You know, 30 to 40% of people with Parkinson's do not have tremor. Right. So you definitely don't have to have tremor. What would be the more classic presentation of Parkinson's than I've got? Parkinson's disease is a degenerative condition of the brain. Uh, the core features that we typically recognise include a combination of tremor, shaking, stiffness and slowing down of muscles and also fairly often kind of a stiffening and slowing down of gait and walking. So when people say there's no cure for Parkinson's, is that right? At the moment there is no cure for Parkinson's. It just means that the damage, the changes in the nerve cells and the neurons in the brain at this point in time cannot be reversed. So in a sense the treatment we're giving is a symptomatic treatment.
I can't tingles down my legs to my knees, and my knees start jerking. And my chest starts getting colder because it feels the cold as one of the rest of me. And it feels that my breath is getting colder when I breathe it in. So that I can see my eyelids are starting to water. I'm not and I'm crying. It's just I start breathing. My knee starts jerking. And it's moving to warm the body. And it figures if it keeps on moving, it'll keep my body warmer. That's what I figure out, but I don't know. I'm trying to convince myself that I've done it every other night for the last two months. Before that, it wasn't so bad. Right. But I fear that I'll lose control. I hate that. My legs are going. I might not be able to talk much longer. You sure. I just take it. Right. What's the time on? It's uh, now nine o'clock, almost nine o'clock. Martin? Martin, are you there? Yeah. It's nine o'clock now. I might go to bed. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no, okay, that's good. Okay, have you done teeth? Yeah. yeah. Brush my teeth and I... Okay, let's go then. I'm gonna go quickly. All right, I drop, drop this. No, I'm gonna drop this. under the camera it's an extremely brave thing you know these are really devastatingly traumatic times for her um, but she's got the sort of the you know the, the 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 courage the strength to say no you've got to show it like it is you've got to tell it like it is you've got to confront it people don't like being misled and it's fair enough for them to expect not to be misled. The point I'm making is... I think that it does display a sort of a fundamental part of Liz's character, which is extreme honesty in facing the world. Can we come inside and talk? She is such a good journalist because she's intensely interested in revealing what she could as honestly as possible about the world. And will you stay here until he steps out? Oh, down? yes, of course, of course. You will stay here yes, until yes, the person... Yes. You know, try and cut through the bullshit, the spin, everything that didn't enable you to get to the, the core of the truth. The boy had hanged himself from the end of his bed with a sheet. He was rushed to hospital and died several hours later. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child states that detention of a child must be the last resort and for the shortest possible time. Imprisonment is a last resort? It doesn't say you can't imprison juveniles. No, but it says imprisonment must be the last resort. Yes, and we would argue that the last resort in the interests of the child is reached 
when they have their third conviction in a, in, a, in a court of law and it's time for them to get some special attention in a place like Dondale. Were they in breach, would it bother you? Well, firstly, you'd have to prove the breach. And then, uh, then I'd consider what, what we did to do about it. So if you're convinced that they are in breach, you might do something about it? I've got to... <laughs> I don't believe we're in breach. But if you were convinced, if you were convinced, if someone were to convince you tomorrow that you were in breach of the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, would you do something about it? No. Declaring the 2011 will be the year we do it. That it was good to feel that engagement with the day-to-day -day politics of the country no, and that no, you right. could engage in that yourself. You could, you could be a player. It consumed most of my days and often seven days a week. You said that a grave decision has been reduced to one of a woman's convenience and the legacy of this is one of unutterable shame. Can you see why women might feel that you are judging them for having an abortion and indeed judging them harshly? I'm not, uh, because Liz... Uh... As time wore on at Four Corners, I got increasingly tired and increasingly stressed and I found that I was coiled up on, in a fetal position in, a, in hotel rooms before I went out and performed. And I think the sort of the crunch point came when I was doing a story in Western Australia about Andrew Forrest's dealings with Aboriginal people over land rights. I, but there's a, a big issue here, Andrew, and the issue comes with, you know, anybody people looking after ourselves from the country that's making you rich, and your shareholders and your investors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I didn't finish the Twiggy Forest program, and I think it's something that I've never quite forgiven myself for. Yeah. Oh. I can't even talk about it. OK. Looking back, these may well have been the first signs of losing dopamine from my brain. This was three years before Parkinson's was diagnosed. But at that time, I had no idea what was going on. Nobody did. I went back and made another two stories just to show that I could still make a good Four Corners. And then I left. And that was a well-considered decision. And I think the right decision although I do miss it. What we want is an acceptance of our history and what has happened to us, the first Australians. Now, don't deny the historical truth. If you can do that, you'll free your heart. I'd look forward to getting fit and healthy and seeing more of my friends, but it proved to be the opposite. I did feel much more lack of initiative and energy than I'd felt before. And that was diagnosed as depression. With his alleged claim of 50 times, trying to break the record is Liz Jackson. From Australia. <laughs> Going 51 times. Veteran performer. I mean, the hardest things for me is being damaged in front of my children and not being the mother that they grew up with. I was becoming much more isolated and depressed and I didn't want them to, to know any of it. I didn't like them to see me in a state where I'd lost control of my emotions. I mean, I guess I'd hoped that somehow, I don't know what I thought that I could get better and without them ever knowing, I mean. I knew something was up. Like I knew she was hiding, yeah, hiding her condition from us and the reality of it. She did not want to talk about it, you know, and I didn't want to talk to her about it because every time that you sort of approach that subject, yeah, it'd be really 
really difficult to talk to her about it and she'd get really upset and so, you know, you just avoid it. <laughs> and then now we're going to move. Down, side, side. Up, down, side, side. Up, down, Charlotte didn't want to see, um, didn't want to go near her or go with her and, you know, mum would get really stressed out playing with Charlotte when I thought, you know, that's it. And the child's going to have no relationship with, with mum. So, trip down to the beach, Charlotte? No thanks. Yoga. It started out with, well, Granny can't pick me up. Your granny can't carry me, or granny can't carry me very far. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I don't like granny. I don't want to, I, do, I don't want granny to, to be near me. I don't want granny to touch me. And then I, of course, tried to explain to Charlotte that granny was sick, and that made things worse. But I don't want to get granny's sickness. You know, and she'd sort of come over and, and you know, whisper, I don't want granny to kiss me. No, not a bag for me. What do you think? Can she have one or no? No. no I can manage without it. See you next week. Bye. You, you don't think, you know, brain disease. You don't think, um, you know, anything more serious. It, it was unknown. It was. It was. Uh, it was a bit scary. It was sort of like, uh, well, what, what is going on? You know, there's no real reason why Liz should be feeling, you know, as uncomfortable as she is, um, as weak as she is, um, you know, without uh, the stress, the other sort of triggers that could have been responsible for it. I think the, the crunch point came when I was doing freestyle. My legs started flopping through the water and then my handwriting went weird. The letters would get smaller and smaller and then until I came to a dead stop. And that was actually something that I eventually looked up under Google. I said, what does it mean if your handwriting gets smaller and then you stop, it stops? And <coughs> you sort of wait while the Google searches and it comes up and it says Parkinson's. So I knew before I gave the list of symptoms that I had to the neurologist that as far as Google was concerned, I had Parkinson's disease. Got a second opinion, but I wasn't happy. I mean, it was like there was Parkinson's again, so I went for a third opinion. I remember the doctor said to me, I just want to tell you this, Liz, I am 99.9% .9 sure that you have Parkinson's. And that seemed a very definitive answer, so that was that. At the time, I was almost relieved. I mean, I, I knew that there were drugs for Parkinson's that can treat the symptoms, and, and this could at least explain why Liz had been getting so much weaker. But even though Liz was already feeling a, a little bit, um, uh, you know, uh, not well, uh, you know, off colour, not as strong as she was, that, that had already started. Um, but um, we, we were still very, um, you know, optimistic yeah. about the future. making the film in, in Tanner and I was flying backwards and forwards um, and, you know, we were all loving the process of making the film. When we finished the film, um, we were invited to the Venice Film Festival you know, a fantastically well-known uh, international festival. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable! We'd arranged for uh, five of the cast to uh, come with us um, uh, on the trip to Venice. OK. They'd never left their island home before, and so we, we were all extremely excited. 
Liz booked into the flight. She had the boarding pass. We were at the departure gate, and that's when she um, has, has a panic attack. It seemed to me we were waiting forever. Just felt I just needed to lie down. And I, I asked, and it, when they said, you can't get on the plane, you, you're not well enough, I think the fight out was gone in me. I just took it. She didn't make the Venice trip. I had to get on the plane and, because uh, I was accompanying all the, the cast from the film, so we had to sort of try and arrange, um, you know, uh, our friend Anne to come and pick her up from the airport. When I got on the plane, um, I just, um, just cried. I, I cried for about, you know, 15, 20 minutes because, you know, it was one of those occasions where you'd been so looking forward to it, so excited about going. I'd so wanted Liz to go. Um, we'd been to Venice before. It was a special place for both of us. And because she didn't get on the plane, I, I just felt really, really horrible. You know, it just seemed such a shame. That was the time where Liz, I think, had her darkest period. After I went back home from the airport, I went to see my GP because I had this infection in my bum. And she looked at it, she said, oh, this it's sort of, there's like a hard area in there. She said, I think you'd better go off to hospital. And um, they looked at the size it was and they said, um, you have to stay. You'll have to stay in the emergency ward. Mum was really sick and, and Dad's gone. And I was like, oh, you know, this is, this is serious. This is adult business now. Like, I have to make some drastic decisions for other people and you can't contact Dad on the phone and Rose is going to know just as much as I do. So we drove to the hospital and then they saw her at the hospital and it, it was bad enough to keep her overnight. And then it became two nights, it became three nights. The infection cleared up, but then she had to go straight to the Aroa Centre to live, you know, in basically like a psych... I don't know what you know. The Euroa Centre is sort of for people who, yeah, need psychological assessment. Those two weeks were terrible, truly eye-opening and really hard to deal with. From all the drugs, she was just completely out of it, calling Rose, Charlotte, calling, you know, like, Oh, Martin was here yesterday. And you're like, Dad hasn't been here for a week. Like, what do you do in those in scenarios? Like, it was really freaky that you were trying to have a conversation with her and you knew that she wasn't following and then I'm carrying her to the bathroom and, you know, she's shivering the whole way to the bathroom. And we called Dad, you know, a week in and said how bad it was, but he's like, you know, I'm coming home as soon as I can. You just got to tough it out. I was really pleased when Martin came back. While she was in hospital, they did, in fact, try, you know, different drugs, but, again, nothing seemed to work. I mean, still suffering regular daily panic attacks, um, feeling dreadful, um, unable to do anything. Um, you know, this was, this was disastrous. And this continued even after she came out of hospital. What is she suffering? Uh, what is the treatment regime? Which way are we moving with these sweeter symptoms? No clarity. We were really lost. Um, and I think that, you know, in a way that the medical profession was also lost, you know, that they, they couldn't understand what was going on either. Then came a new and devastating diagnosis. You know, someone who'd been treated with sort of conventional treatments for anxiety and depression over a four or five year period and hadn't gotten better. That was kind of, I think, the first giveaway for me, that we're not dealing with a standard 
anxiety or depressive disorder? Could it be something else? The Parkinsonism, the nightmares and the mild hallucinations, those were the main features that I used to make a clinical diagnosis and it's something that we corroborated with the PET scan. So that showed some changes which we, we would see typically in Lewy body disease. So Can you explain what Lewy bodies is? The Lewy bodies just refer to these uh, clumps of protein. They're blocking the signals from that part of the brain to the rest of the brain. Lewy bodies that had any particular malfunction associated with them? We can't actually see Lewy bodies. The Lewy bodies are actually only seen uh, under the microscope, so it'd have to be post-mortem. I don't really want to have an autopsy on my brain just yet. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the location of the Lewy bodies uh, determines the symptoms that, that people develop. When they have an impact on your cognitive capacity, yes. where are they located? Then they're, then they're also located in the cerebral cortex. In the cerebral cortex? Yes, which is obviously higher up um, in, in the brain. And so it deals with higher order? Yes. Functions? Yes. And I've got some that are blocked? Yes. So that means dementia? For me, um, I'm, I'm not clear. I, I guess it's a possibility, right? But but certainly there there is uh, uh, it is associated with cognitive impairment. So that's what you think I've got Louis body disease. Louis body disease. Louis Louis body disease. Yes. I don't like the sound of that. Shall we have a break or? I don't like things that talk about losing my brain function. I don't like the, the connection with dementia and Lewy bodies. But I'm a bit fragile today, so I'm normally not fragile. What's this? Excuse me. Wasn't that Louis bodies that Robin Williams had when he killed himself? Mm-hmm. Sometimes I think that they think I'm sicker than I am. It almost certainly is virtually impossible to, uh, to arrive at a... Um, a sort of a, a clinically secure diagnosis because of the, of the sort of the three major things that, that have been raised, you know, which are depression, Parkinson's and Lewy body disease. All of them have no way of definitively saying whether you've got them or not. There is no test that will tell you, yes, you've got depression, yes, you've got uh, Parkinson's, yes, you've got Lewy body disease, none of them. Mentally, I just want to block out that I've got Lewy bodies. I mean, it was like when I said to him, I don't like that diagnosis. I mean, I just don't want to accept that because I know what it means. Then I, I'm probably in denial, but I'm in denial because it's, I want to deny it. I mean. Wouldn't you want to? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Actually, which I should probably wear with this skirt. Top from Agnes B. Ah, oh, yes. That was a beauty. We're, we're, we're talking, what's her name, Quant? Mary Quant. Mary Quant. Mary Quant. 1970s. I need a tight black polar neck jumper up to here, but I need to go down to about here and quite thick. I need sort of black stockings that are thicker than these, but not as baggy. I've got some boots, some high boots up to here. Um, then I need to just have the facelift, the, um, the lips done, um, the boob job, and then I'm set. Oh, a brain transplant. And the brain transplant. Now that's all to make for the fact that I won't have a brain by that stage. I'll just try and get away with the cute clothes and the boob job.
Fragile little baby. So I like this one. Oh, lovely. All lying in bed together. <laughs> Chubby little bugger. <laughs> Our farewell kiss. That's right. The self timer is a great shot. I've always been really proud of that. You start thinking about, well, how long have I got before I have the kind of dementia that I wouldn't want to be living with? I haven't had suicidal thoughts, but I now understand why people do commit suicide, which I never understood before. I don't think pain is a reason for killing yourself, but I do think that dementia is a reason for wanting to end your life. It's not a well-developed um, thought. It's something that I suppose that I've, uh, to the extent I've thought about it, I've thought I should talk to Martin about it, because, which I haven't done, um, because he would be involved in making that decision, I think. Because part of it is to do with being intolerable to look after and not wanting to be, you know, where you have to be toileted and spoon-fed and you don't know your own children. I mean, I don't want that. And I don't want to not be myself to the extent that I don't have what I regard as the ability to to love and to work, is what Sigmund Freud said. That's a, what you need to be a living human being, the capacity to love and to work. And I think he's right. I'm interested to know what Martin thinks. Um, I don't um, share Liz's view about... Um, uh, suicide euthanasia um, as she's um, described it. I, I do think um, I, I still can't really understand it. Um, for me, um, life is so, um, so much all there is and so enjoyable in so many ways um, that um, even when things get, you know, really, really desperate, I, I can't help feeling emotionally that, um, you know, you, you'd want to uh, hold on to it for as long as you possibly could. Let's, let's talk it out, but, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in any event, it's going to be, um, you know, really, really hard to find the line. That one of yours. Three years in, we've uh, had the diagnosis of Parkinson's, um, but drugs for that don't seem to make any difference. Diagnosis of depression, drugs for that don't make any difference. Um, and Liz getting worse all the time. We've been seeing all these highly qualified people for a very long time. We've been sort of doing exactly what they've suggested in terms of treatment, um, and nothing is working. I'm doing the Herald one. No, 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 this is the Australian one. That's much easier. Good. I'm good at these. I'm ceasing to care whether it's mm. depression, Parkinson's or Lewy bodies. The course of treatment is essentially the same anyway. United one. Whatever that you, you put as the diagnosis, we've got to get rid of the panic attacks. Oh. Yeah, I've just got the a bag of medicine. So let's try and get a little bit scientific about it. We wrote a detailed daily log of exactly when Liz woke, uh, what drug she took, at what time, what the effect on her body throughout the day was, day by day. So you, you've taken the morning ones. You've got two doses of Matapar left. I did that for about two weeks. When I read through the log, something seemed apparent to me. That was, the panic attacks always started two hours after the dose of Matapar. 
the dopamine drug. Could the wearing off of the dopamine levels be the key? Pretty good evidence. Pretty good yeah. evidence. Yeah, that's right. We sent this, this detailed log to uh, the, the psychiatrists, the neurologists, to all the doctors. It looks to us like there is a connection between the Matapar and the panic attacks. Can we discuss? Yes, hang on. Hang on a sec. Oh, Martin's getting in. It's all right. What did they come across? I will send you the email. I'm sure you'll find it interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, you do see a, a pretty oh, depressing yeah. pattern in there. The short story was increase the dosage of the Matapar, increase the frequency of the dosage so that, you know, you wouldn't have a, an hour or an hour and a half of panic between each dose. And the panic attacks did slowly start um, uh, getting uh, less intense um, and, uh, and over time, um, you know, largely removed from the day. I reckon I'd take the, uh, the, the dose now. Yeah. It's two no, and a half hours now. Two and a half hours? Yeah. I'm feeling a bit as if I needed it. This one here is the new one. Comptan Martin? Yeah which is um, proving to be quite useful. It, it sort of delays the operation of the Matapar so that it lasts longer. And you essentially get about another 20 minutes out of any dose that you take. And as it is, I'm taking six doses a day. And so that extra Two you know, hours. 15 minutes can give you, you know, 45 minutes, which is, means that you can stay up till, you know, nine o'clock. <laughs> Good, thanks. No, I have been finding, I've been having quite a good time on the con town. Yeah, cool. Yeah, get it, right. it's, it's made a significant difference. Fantastic. Um, but that's the impression I'm getting from just this snapshot compared to what you were going through back then. It was so horrendous. There's also testament to the fact that, you know, we are starting to get the medication right, uh, which I think we're kind of getting there. I mean, what, what's, the, what's the actual prognosis? You know, the whole struggle this last 18 months has been kind of getting you towards where you are now. Once we get, you know, once we get the kind of the, the dopamine stimulation all kind of evened out, you know, the matapar and the content stitched together nicely so everything's even, I think there's a very good chance that we'll be able to, you know, keep you good and keep you functioning well with a kind of good, acceptable quality of life. I want to hear how you day love, love you. You say, je t'aime. Je t'aime. That means I love you, yeah. So when your mummy comes around to pick you up, you can say, je t'aime. And she'll know that you love her. Fun. And I did you, and do you want to hold the royal ball? I'm happy to host the royal ball, yeah. I'll, I'll host the royal ball. This was quite recent, you know, that we were, I dropped Charlotte off there in the morning and I was heading to work and, Mum had just sort of woken up and she came into the kitchen and she stumbled and she smashed her face on the side of the TV, just lost her footing and it was really awful and confronting and she was sort of holding her face and crying and, and Dad was, you know, holding her and everyone was sort of silent and just, you know, tense and Charlotte was, you know, Granny has an owie, we need to get Granny a Band-Aid you know, and was sort of, you know, bossing everyone around, um, you know, about how we needed to fix this situation and what Granny needed to do and what we needed to do. And, and that's a bit like what it is for now. Like, she really cares about Granny and knows she's sick and, you know, sees herself as playing some role in managing that. Yeah, but it's a dwarf planet. I mean, oh, it's actually really it's planet. Planet. Neptune and Pluto oh, will be that's Neptune and that's Uranus. That's uh, I'm going Saturn and... Which is the one that's next to Saturn, Uranus or Neptune? Neptune. Okay. She somehow seems to want to know more about it. She wants. To, she asks if she can give it, give me my medicine. So can you give it to me. Yeah. Um, in Christian tradition, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael are what? Angels. It 
hasn't all been plain sailing in so far as I had some terrible times that probably all came from inside my head where sometimes I didn't trust Martin in relation to the medication. He knew much more about it, had spent more time researching it than I had and knew what he was doing and that I should trust him. And it was really important to him that I did. And that was really difficult because sometimes I felt that he'd just given up on me. He had had enough. The, you know, that was it. I just pushed, you know, my mad paranoia, weakness too far and he left the room and he left the room and he stayed away for ages. And I went and found him. But I said to him, I just thought you were leaving the room waiting till I, so I, you wouldn't have to watch me dying in front of you. And I think that was what I really felt at the time, which is just completely crazy. I was telling Bentley and about the importance of you put on trust and how you felt I didn't trust you to look after me. I thought that you just left me to die. Um, I hope you don't now leave me to die as a result of me telling um, Bentley the story. I just thought we're in for telling the truth, aren't we? Oh, no, absolutely. And look, there, there have been, a, you know, a couple of times where um, there's been a, a, you know, a conflict over, you know, um, the, the treatment because, um, you know, I'm suggesting, you know, a particular, you take a particular drug and, um, and you, you haven't wanted to, you know, I mean, it's, it's happened a few times and, uh, and, and it, is, it is difficult because, you know, uh, I, I need you to trust me. back to haunt you. Your trust in their affection. That because you're feeling, why would you stick around, you know? People say it's because he loves me. I think he does like me quite a lot. He's used to living with me, and he likes the kids. And we're a family. And we respect each other, which I think is really important. Like I, it's important that I keep my intelligence, because I think one of the things Martin respects about me is that I'm reasonably smart, and I was. And uh, I used to be OK to have a good time with. So I think there's enough of that left. That sounds really pathetic. Take the pathos out of that, and that's what I think. You know, that's been my view from the very beginning, that, um, uh, you know, Liz is the person that I wanted to spend my life with, and I have done, and it's been, you know, truly fabulous. I'm looking forward to years of continuing to enjoy Liz's unique and fabulous personality. And that's... Um, that's a fabulous life, you know. Few. Few. Give you a choice.
just gonna draw. See, 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 see. I can do it. 